News of the Times Serial Killer Saturdays Serial Killer Children Two Elizabeths and a Mary Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, we are exploring three historic cases of serial killer children. Due to the age, we have lowered the bar of kills or attempted kills to two for the label of serial killer. Our first case takes place in 1810 London. Elizabeth Hinchcliffe, 14, and in service to a family as was the norm of the time, is finding the two children in her care trying. Elizabeth allegedly finds a way to deal with those irritating children. Our second case takes place in 1844, and 12-year-old Mary Johnson stands accused of killing her two brothers as her family try to understand what has happened. And our last case takes place in 1867, and Elizabeth Wielden, 17, is allegedly looking for a way to decrease her workload. Three historic cases of serial killer children is today's episode of Serial Killer Saturdays, and we hope you enjoy the show. Elizabeth Hinchcliffe, 14, 1810. Fourteen-year-old Elizabeth Hinchcliffe is in service to Mrs. Anne Parker. Being in service at this young age was not unusual at the time. There are references to Mrs. Anne Parker running a type of daycare, similar to baby farmers, but legitimately. She has taken into her care as servant Elizabeth Hinchcliffe. There is testimony referencing the poor home life Elizabeth was in before the kindness of Mrs. Anne Parker taking her in. Not unusual at the time, the house had a rat problem. In the basement, an arsenic was the usual remedy. A request for the arsenic is done through a letter, with Elizabeth being tasked to take the letter to the chemists and return with the requested arsenic. From here... Strange things begin to happen. From the pilot, London, 22nd of September, 1810, Old Bailey. Elizabeth Hinchcliffe, a girl of 14 years of age, was capitally indicted under the statute called Lord Ellenborough's Act for feloniously administering poison to Mrs. Anne Parker of Tavistock Row, Covent Garden, with whom she lived as a servant, and also to Christopher, John Stanley, and Samuel Smith, two children who boarded with the Protectrix, Mrs. Anne Parker, on the 16th of August last, with intent to murder them. Mrs. Parker stated that the prisoner lived with her as a servant, and that some short time before this transaction, in consequence of the prisoner Elizabeth Hinchcliffe telling her that the lower part of the house was overrun with rats. She sent her with a note to Mr. Midgley, a chemist and druggist in the Strand, requesting him to send her some poison for the rats. He accordingly sent her a small parcel containing about two ounces, which the prosecutorix, Mrs. Anne Parker, put into the back locker of a large writing desk in her shop. On the evening above mentioned, she desired the prisoner Elizabeth Hinchcliffe to bring up tea, which she did, and then sent her out with some half-pence to buy some mortar to mix with glass in order to lay over the rat holes. While the prisoner Elizabeth Hinchcliffe was out, she cut some bread and butter for the children and poured out tea for herself and them. The children drank theirs, her own stood until it was nearly cold, and she drank it off and immediately perceived a burning sensation in her throat and her stomach, which she conceived to arise from pepper by some accident put into the tea. The sensation increased violently. 
She filled up another cup to drink in hope of alleviating the symptoms, but fortunately was prevented from drinking it by one of the children being suddenly seized with vomiting, which she first attributed to having overeaten itself, and then the other child was affected in a like manner. In a little time, her own sensations increased, and she thought she felt that they had reached her backbone. Shortly afterwards, the prisoner, Elizabeth Hinchcliffe, returned, and she asked her if she had put anything into her tea, and if she had, to acknowledge it immediately, as she could get something from the chemists to bring up what she was swallowed, and there should be no more said about it. The prisoner, Elizabeth Hinchcliffe, positively denied that she had. The prosecutorix, Mrs. Anne Parker, then said she hoped the prisoner, Elizabeth Hinchcliffe, had not been playing any tricks with the parcel from Mr. Midgley's, the chemist. This she also denied, and told her if she would look at the parcel, she would find it just as the gentleman had given it to her. The prosecutorix to Mrs. Anne Parker then went and examined the parcel, and was convinced it remained just in the same state as she had received it, but still perceiving the symptoms increase, and being seized with a tremor, she said there was no time to be lost, and she took the parcel and set out for Mr. Midgley's, but was taken so ill on her way that she was afraid of dying before she could get there and that the children at home would also die, and no one would ever discover the cause. She, however, with great difficulty, reached Mr. Midgley's and showed him the parcel, told him what had happened, and he made up some medicine, which he immediately administered to the children, and they were soon recovered. She herself took some medicine, but a fortnight elapsed before she was quite recovered. Mr. Midgley stated that in consequence of the note from Mrs. Parker and the desire of the prisoner Elizabeth Hinchcliffe that he should send more poison than he had sent on a former occasion, he packed up the two ounces and gave it to her. And examining the parcel returned by the prosecutorix, he found that it contained less by a quarter of an ounce, and that it had been opened and not tied up in the way in which it, he had tied it. He was convinced that the symptoms apparent on the prosecutorix and the children were the consequences of swallowing mineral poison such as arsenic would produce. He examined the tea in the pot. It had a metallic taste. He procured some more of the tea which was not Chinese but British herb tea. He infused it with some arsenic in water, and found it had the same taste and appearance with that in the teapot of Mrs. Parker. This case made most of the papers, but was more of a back-page story than a headline story. From the Kentish Gazette, the 25th of September, 1810, Old Bailey. Elizabeth Hinchcliffe, a girl the age of 14 years, was indicted for administering arsenic to her mistress, Anne Parker, with intent to poison and murder her. The evidence of Mrs. Parker stated that the young girl at the bar was taken by her from her parents with a view to bring her up in a better state than a common servant. That the prisoner Elizabeth Hinchcliffe in August last complained that the kitchen was overrun with rats and advised her to get some poison to destroy them. She sent her to Midgley's, a chemist in the Strand, with a note to procure some arsenic. This the prisoner brought home, and it was put into a bureau where the prisoner knew it was and had access to it. The morning of the 18th of August, the mistress perceived a strange taste in her first cup of tea, and she was going to take a second cup, but declined, as she was soon afterwards seized with vomiting, and all the symptoms of mineral poisoning. Two children, who had also had some tea, 
were seized with the like symptoms. She accused the prisoner having put poison in her tea, but she denied it, and said she would find the paper in the same state which was given to her for the, from the chemist. Mr. Midgley was next called, who proved the sale of the arsenic to the prisoner, and that he afterwards examined the parcel, and that it was not in the same state which he had made it up, but that it had been opened and a part of it taken out. He afterwards mixed it with some of the same sort of herb tea which Mrs. Parker had drunk, and it tasted just the same as that which remained in the other pot. The girl in her defence stated, My mistress ill-used me. The jury, after some hesitation, found her guilty, but they and the prosecutorix recommended her to mercy on account of her youth. With the verdict of guilty and the recommendation to mercy, including a recommendation from the mistress, who she tried to poison, Elizabeth's death sentence was commuted to transportation. And on May the 9th, 1812, Elizabeth boarded the convict ship, the Minstrel, and she arrived in New South Wales approximately four months later. Our second story involves the youngest of this set of child Borgias with Mary Ann Johnson, who was twelve. 1844. Information on this case is sketchy and incomplete, so we are only able to surmise certain aspects of the case. Twelve-year-old Mary Johnson is the daughter of a mother who has married again. Her married mother had two sons with her stepfather, and we can only surmise that Mary Johnson is expected to look after her two siblings whilst her mother and stepfather are away. From the Wiltshire Independent on the 29th of February 1844, Murders by a Young Girl. On Monday evening last was committed to Lincoln Castle for trial at the ensuing assizes, charged with the willful murder of her two little brothers, Mary Johnson, a girl not yet thirteen years of age. The prisoner, twelve-year-old Mary Johnson's stories as follows. She went to Mr. Overton's shop, the chemist, and asked for a penny worth of arsenic, which, after a great deal of hesitation, she obtained. The same night, when partaking their meal, the two children were poisoned and died early the next morning. Within two hours of each other, William the Younger having expired first. On the night in question, Farr, the father, and his wife, upon their return from chapel, found the two children at a neighbour's house under the same roof, and labouring under all of the alarming symptoms, retching, purging, and vomiting, consequent upon poisoned by arsenic, which continued without interruption until they died. On the day after the death of the two children, the father, hearing that the prisoner, his daughter, had procured poison from Mr. Overton's shop, took her with him and confronted her with Mr. Overton, putting the question, Did this girl get any poison here? Being answered in the affirmative, the father then asked the girl what she did with it. She replied, I gave it to a woman on the road who sent me for it and after vigilant inquiry by the officers and police, no such woman, as she described, can be found. Mr. Kumak, a surgeon, made a post-mortem examination on both bodies and detected arsenic in the stomach of both of them. The housekeeper underwent a very severe and trying cross-examination by the coroner, but nothing could be elicited from her or the father to incriminate anyone but the unfortunate prisoner, and upon the coroner's address to her upon the verdict and the painful duty which devolved on him in sending one so young in years to prison and to trial, she appeared to be the only one in an unusually crowded court who remained unmoved, indifferent, and mute. 
at another stage of the investigation, being asked by the coroner if she should know the woman again or could describe her dress and person, she answered she had never seen her before or since, but that she was a tall woman wearing a brown cloak, a white straw bonnet with coloured ribbons, and carrying a reticule basket, and that she accompanied the woman on the high road as far as the guidepost leading to Butterwick, being a distance of between 200 and 300 yards from Mr. Overton's, where the woman left her and pursued her journey towards Boston, and the girl returned home. After vigilant inquiry by the officers and police, no such woman could be found. At this stage of the proceedings, a witness was produced who completely refuted the statement of the prisoner and swore that on the day in question she was going on to the high road to Boston and saw a woman coming over Mr. Overton's style and that she also saw the prisoner, but that they never came near to one another and that no communication did or could take place between them. Mr. Overton proved serving the prisoner, Mary Johnson, with a quarter of an ounce of arsenic, and he asked her how they were going to use it. She said to poison mice. He advised the girl to be very cautious where she put it, as it was highly dangerous, and then took the precaution of duly labelling it with the word poison. Mr. Kabak surgeon made a post-mortem examination of both bodies and detected arsenic in the stomachs of both of them. Tuesday night, a report is prevalent that the youthful murderess, now in our castle, has made a confession to the Reverend Mr. Richter, the chaplain, which implicates other parties. We have searched the archive, but have been unable to discover how this case progresses, other than the last small article stating that she has confessed and implicated others. Whether this refers to the mysterious unknown woman or another, we do not know. From the Leeds Intelligentsia, the 30th of March, 1844, Mary Ann Johnson, a girl not yet thirteen years of age, committed to the Lincoln Assizes for the willful murder of William and David Farr, was discharged in consequence of the indictment not containing the word felonious. It is possible if she did indeed do it, she got away with it. We find no trace of her after partially due to her very common name. We end this episode of Serial Killer Saturdays with the story of Elizabeth Wilden, 17, in 1867. This interesting case from 1867 may have been influenced by the famous Fenning case of 1815. The Fenning Dumpling case of 1815, generally regarded as a travesty of justice and covered by News of the Times, caused a ripple effect for some time with cases that came forward of servants poisoning their master or mistress. In this case, Elizabeth Wielden is in service to a farmer and his family. She has been in this position with the family for approximately six months. The couple have seven children, the oldest being a girl of twelve. Part of Elizabeth's duties included helping to look after the two youngest children, Martha, aged one and a half years, and Joseph, an infant. The farm has had a known rat problem, and arsenic mixed with oatmeal has been left out in bowls around the farm in the evenings and then taken up in the mornings. This practice has not always been successful, with several of the chickens dying, as well as one of the dogs, so the practice is stopped. The arsenic package is left on a higher shelf so that the children cannot access it, but the two youngest previously healthy children die, and in a manner that looks suspiciously like 
having been poisoned. From the Illustrated Police News, the 18th of May, 1867, alleged murder of two children by poisoning. Alfreton, Derbyshire, Tuesday night. One of the most remarkable cases of alleged poisoning of two children has been under inquiry today. The excitement consequence upon the known and still more upon the suspected circumstances of the case being most intense. The alleged facts are as follows. On the 19th instant, Joseph, the infant Joseph of Joseph Tamlinson, who is a farmer at Sherland Dells, about a mile from the town, died after an illness of only five hours, having been attended to by Mr. Turner, the surgeon of this place, who was suddenly called in, but who could, as it was stated, only account for the death as resulting from convulsions, and the child was accordingly buried. On the evening of Monday the 22nd, another child, aged two years, was seized with vomiting and faintness, dying within about 36 hours after first being seized, and in this case, also, Mr. Turner attended the child but could not in any way account for the death, and an inquest was opened by Mr. Bushby, the coroner of North Derbyshire, consequent upon which the stomach and its contents were sent to the Professor Taylor of Guy's Hospital for analysis. Arsenic being found, the body of the other child was exhumed and the stomach also sent to Dr. Taylor. And the interim inquiries were set on foot, foot, which resulted in the apprehension of a servant girl named Elizabeth Wielden, who was taken before Mr. Moorwood, the magistrate, and remanded. The adjourned inquest on the two children was resumed this morning by Mr. Busby, the county coroner at the George Hotel. Mr. Peach, from the office of Mr. J. D. Smith, solicitor of Derby, attended to watch the case on behalf of the girl, Wielden. Superintendent Ryan of Alfreton and Detective Sergeant Davis of Derby, who apprehended the girl, were present on behalf of the police authorities by whom the arrangements for the press and public were amply and considerably made. The coroner, after the jury had answered to their names, said he proposed to take the evidence as to the youngest child, Joseph the infant. The first witness called was Joseph Tomlinson, father of the children, who described the illness of the child Joseph, which was at first apparently not serious, but soon much worse, when he came home from chapel in the evening that he sent the girl Wielden for the doctor. The child got worse and died before eleven o'clock. His wife nursed it. She told him the girl Wielden had given it some sausage. There was some arsenic in the house he had brought to kill rats. He had five children living, all older than the deceased. The oldest was twelve, and in answer to the coroner, he said she was tall for her age and might have been able to reach the arsenic where it was placed. But he had told his wife and servant to be careful, for when he put some in the barn to kill the rats, the fowls got in and some of them died. The witness then detailed at great length a quantity of perfectly irrelevant information. The only point of interest or importance being that on the day the child died, the girl, Wilden, had been scolded for staying out till nine o'clock instead of returning at six o'clock, and both witness and his wife had rebuked her for her improper conduct, and speaking to the younger children about her intimacy with men and how many lovers she had. It was on Good Friday that she, Elizabeth Wilden, was told that her father said the best thing would be to send her to Derby Jail 
for a month if she would not do her duty. That was a few days before the second child died. A new hat was also missed and found destroyed in a cupboard that belonged to the child Martha, since dead. Anne Tomlinson, the wife of the last witness, gave evidence at great length as to the conduct of the girl Wielden and the symptoms from which the child had suffered. Mr. Taylor reported the results of his analysis, which was to detect arsenic in the stomach and intestines submitted to him for examination. There was no indication of disease or natural causes to account for death, which he attributed to the administration of arsenic. This related to the child, Joseph. As to the other child, Martha, Dr. Taylor reported to the same effect. The stomach and intestines contained arsenic, which would account for death, and no other cause for death could be detected. After some further evidence by Dr. Taylor, who said he never had two clearer cases of poisoning by arsenic than those under inquiry, the coroner said he was obliged to attend another case a few miles away, and after some discussion it was agreed to adjourn the inquest till Friday. The inquest lasted nearly eight hours. The inquest continued a few days later. It established that the paper in which the arsenic was held has a hole in which was not there before. Unusual behaviour of Elizabeth is recounted in terms of a breaking the usual pattern of when the children are up and dressed and where they are taken up in the house. The father also comments on the perceived lack of care on the other part of Elizabeth, when the second child, Martha, one and a half years, is taken ill. Lastly, it is reported hearsay that when asked if she was not sad that the children were dead, Elizabeth's response was, No, I shall have less work to do. The inquest jury returns a verdict of willful murder against Elizabeth and she is committed to trial. Things would seem to be looking bleak for Elizabeth as she goes to trial. From the Times, the 25th of July, 1867, Crown Court. Elizabeth Wielden, a girl aged 17 years of age, was indicted for the willful murder of Joseph, the infant child of Joseph and Anne Tomlinson. Mr. Stephen and Mr. Cave appeared for the Crown. Mr. T. Blackburn and Mr. Meller defended the prisoner. The deceased Joseph Infant was born on the 6th of last March. His father is a farmer at Sherland Delves near Alfriston in this county. And in the beginning of April, his family consisted of himself, his wife, their seven children, of whom the eldest, a girl, was 12 years of age, and the prisoner who came into their service in the end of last January. The child Joseph was of, of a healthy constitution. On Tuesday the 9th of April, the mother was left home with the deceased child Joseph and the prisoner, the other children having gone to school at 9 o'clock, and the husband having gone to Alfreton at 11 to attend the county court. After the other children had left for school, the mother prepared some sago with milk and sugar, and having taken some herself, placed the remainder in a teacup in the living room for the purpose of giving it to the child when it had been dressed. At noon, however, as it was dressed, the child went to sleep, and the sago remained unconsumed. At about three o'clock in the afternoon, the mother went out of doors to bring up some clothes to dry, leaving the child asleep on the sofa. After an absence of ten minutes, she returned and found the prisoner walking about the living room with the child awake in her arms. 
Mrs. Tomlinson asked the girl who said that the child had begun to cry, why she had not given it the same sago in the cupboard. The girl said she had done so and pointed out the teacup empty. Her mistress complained that she had given the child too much, as the cup was nearly three parts full, notwithstanding with the child appeared very hungry and took the breast eagerly. It then fell asleep and so remained until six o'clock when it awoke up and was sick and after a little while it appeared better and dozed again. Waking up a second time, the child vomited again and appeared to be in great pain. It continued to suffer until about eight o'clock when Mr. Turner, a surgeon of Alfreton, was sent for. On coming to the child and making inquiries, Mr. Turner was led to believe that the child was suffering from indigestion in consequence of too much sago having been given to it, and having recommended a warm bath, he left, promising to send some anti-spasmodic medicine. The medicine duly arrived, but at the interval the child had become much worse. The vomiting and purging increased greatly, the limbs twitched convulsingly, and the eyes rolled. The child struggled, then grew weaker and weaker, and finally died between ten and eleven o'clock on the same evening. Subsequently, in consequence of suspicions excited by the death of another of Mr. Tomlinson's children, Martha, aged one and a half, the body of the infant was exhumed, and on the 7th of May, the viscera was taken out and forwarded to Professor Taylor of Guy's Hospital for examination. It was then discovered that the whole of the viscera contained arsenic in large quantity. The arsenic. It turned out that some time about the middle of January, Mr. Tomlinson purchased some arsenic which had been coloured with an imitation of smoke for the purpose of killing rats. The arsenic was kept upon a shelf in the cellar at such a height that none of the children could reach it, but the cellar door was not locked, and any member of the family who could reach the shelf could get at the poison. After it was purchased, the poison was used from time to time down to the middle of March, by mixing portions of it with oatmeal and placing it on a plate about the house or at outbuildings, leaving it there the last thing at night and removing it again the next morning. Somehow or other, however, some fowls got to the plates and poisoned themselves on one occasion, and a dog did the same upon another. On the latter occurrence, Mr. Tomlinson was much put about, and cautioned the prisoner and another woman who was in the house washing against the careless use of so dangerous an article. Although the use of the arsenic was discontinued, its place was not changed, and it was still kept on the shelf in the cellar, accessible to any grown-up or intimate with the house. The trial of evidence. For the purpose of connecting the prisoner with the crime, it was shown that she had admitted to having administered Sago to the children at about three o'clock on the day of its death. The only occasion on that day, according to the evidence of the mother, when anything was given to it except the breast. The mother, having given it no food all day, and the other children, having been away from the home, from nine o'clock in the morning until after the child was taken ill. The arsenic in the parcel on the shelf was coloured blue, and in the stomach of the child a similar colouring matter was found. The motive was suggested to be a desire to be rid of the trouble the children gave, and a witness was called who deposed to a conversation with the prisoner in the course of which she expressed satisfaction at the death of the child, as it would no longer give her trouble. 
The summation. His lordship is summing up, commenting that of the evidence bore very slightly against the prisoner, and, but for the fact that she had given the sago to the child, was quite consistent with her innocence. As for the sago, it, it, if that contained the coloured arsenic, it was rather strange that none of the witnesses noticed any colouring matter either in the child's vomit or in the cup which had contained the sago. Elizabeth Wielding was found not guilty and released. The deaths of the two children remained a mystery. Elizabeth was, of course, released from service to the family. Did she or didn't she? We believe that had it not been for the Fenning trial, which was well remembered for decades after 1815, Elizabeth would have been found guilty. That concludes this episode of Serial Killer Children, the two Elizabeths and the Mary. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, please subscribe. Our goal is 1,000 subscribers, and with the fantastic support of our wonderful News of the Times community, we are making great progress towards that goal. We upload four days a week. Saturdays are Serial Killer Saturdays, where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time spans of these ranges from as early as the mid-16th century to the 21st century and encompasses men, women, children and couples who kill. Mondays are murderous where we investigate in depth a historical murder. Wednesdays are wicked where we pull together stories of a similar theme such as stories of murders by starvation. And Fridays are frightful, with stories that are grouped by geographic location, allowing us to share lesser-known grisly crime stories. From all of us at the News of the Times team, thank you again for watching or listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles. <laughs>